Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 10th of June. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 13th of June, with me, Michael Hewson. I think one of the key concerns that investors have had this week has been um, inflation. And if you look back to say two weeks ago, I think there was some optimism that we could well be near a peak as far as US inflation is concerned. I think there was always a belief that inflation in Europe was slightly lagging behind, but certainly I think as a leading indicator, perhaps there was this perception that US inflation was always slightly ahead of everything else. And certainly in recent numbers, we have started to see some evidence that PPI um, in particular had started to top out in the US. And if you look at the, the PCE numbers in the US, they've been on the decline since um, the March peaks. Um, but, and I think that is, I think one of the reasons why we started to see equity markets roll over this week is that inflation is likely to become a much more persistent as we head towards the end of the year. If you cast your mind back to say, for example, um, six months ago at the beginning of this year, I think there was an expectation that while these current inflationary pressures were likely to, to be high, they would probably trail off fairly quickly towards year end. That is becoming increasingly less likely. Um, we've got oil prices back at three month highs above $120 a barrel. We've got talk of food shortages, supply chain um, problems. And obviously the ch we've also got China, world's second biggest economy. There was some early optimism on Monday that the uh, loosening of COVID restrictions um, in Shanghai and Beijing might prompt a fairly decent rebound in economic activity. And certainly I think in the context of April, um, the May numbers should show an improvement when it comes to retail sales and industrial production. But the fact of the matter is China's zero COVID policy will mean that we won't get a V-shaped rebound in the Chinese economy. Within two days of these restrictions being relaxed, there's been reports that we're getting isolated COVID cases in Shanghai, prompting new lockdowns. So I think any China recovery is going to be very stop-start in nature. It's going to be very difficult to determine a, tra a, a clear tra trajectory for a recovery unless or until um, China drops its zero COVID policy. And at the moment, that doesn't look likely given the low vaccination rates amongst its population. So where does that leave us? Well, certainly in terms of US 10-year yields, we've rebounded off the 50-day moving average and we're now back above 3%. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're probably going to go back above the highs, but certainly the direction of travel here um, shows that we're probably at risk of more upside than we are downside. If we want to have confidence that a top is in for inflation, we need to see a break of this key support area here as well as the 50 day moving average. And that doesn't look very likely. If we look at the dollar index, it doesn't look dissimilar. We've seen a fairly decent rebound over the course of the past few days, again, off the 50 day moving average. I think one other thing that has shifted over the course of the past two weeks is the willingness of central banks to deliver outsized rate hikes. So we've seen the Bank of Canada um, embark on a 50 basis point rate hike last week with the intention that they're probably going to do more. We've seen the RBA this week follow suit with a 50 basis point rate hike of its own, with again the um, expectation that they're probably going to deliver more. And let's not forget the, the, the RBA is behind the curve, pretty much like the European Central Bank, which yesterday um, indicated that it intends to move its headline rate um, up by 25 basis points in July, with the potential for another 50 basis points in September. We could get 25 in September. It really depends, I think, on the overall um, stickiness or otherwise of headline inflation. You know, and if you look at headline inflation rates, CPI rates in the euro area, um, yes, the headline rate for EU is 8.1, but in places like Lithuania, um, and, it's, and, and Estonia, it's above 16, 17, 18 percent. And yet in France, it's at 5.4. So um, 
it was very telling that Christine Lagarde was asked a question about where the ECB saw the neutral rate for um, inflation. Well, I suppose that really depends on where you are in Europe, because the neutral rate is going to be a lot higher in the Baltic states um, than it is in, say, somewhere like France or Germany. So that, I think, encapsulates the big, the big challenge that the ECB faces when it looks to raise interest rates or when it starts to raise interest rates and is reflected, I think, most starkly in this chart here, which is a spread between Italian 10-year yields and German 10-year yields. And the ECB won't want to see this graph here go back to the levels that we saw back in 2018. That is the spread between the 10-year Bund and the 10-year BTP. And 10-year BTP rates are 223 basis points above um, German rates. And the ECB won't want to see that blow out. And they call that fragmentation risk, fragmentation between 10-year yields across the bond curve. And that in itself is going to present enormous challenges for the ECB going forward. And that's why um, the euro sold off quite aggressively yesterday. So if we look at the euro dollar, um, we look at the down, if we look at the daily chart that I've drawn here, we can see that we did try and break that trend line from the um, highs this year. We briefly broke above it, but we weren't able to get back above this 107, 70, 80 level, and we've drifted back down again. So the challenge, I think, for the moment is, or the, the bias for the moment is for further euro weakness and for further dollar strength to really undermine that. If we look at, say, for example, the dollar index and we look at the euro dollar, we need to see a correlation between the two. We need to see a break above 107.80, 108 on the euro to suggest that we've got a short term base in the bigger, bigger level on, on this particular chart is 103.40. So I think while we're below 108, the bias remains for euro weakness and further dollar strength on a charting basis. In terms of the pound, pound certainly facing its challenges over the course of the next few days. It's been trading in this window here on this chart with a very big barrier at around about 126. 50 day moving average is also acting as a fairly decent cap on that, but it is finding a fair degree of support at around about the 124 and a half, 124 20 area. So we need to see where and how that breaks out over the course of the next few days and weeks. But certainly I think bearish bets and pessimism over the pound is starting to become the overriding narrative when it comes to listening to people um, um, talk about the direction of travel for the pound. And in my experience, when people get start getting overly negative on sterling, that's the time to buy it. Um, peak bearishness, I call it. And generally, it tends to be fairly reliable. If we look at euro sterling, that's pretty much a snooze fest. Like watching paint dry, we are still very much capped at around 86. That remains the key resistance level with fairly decent support at around about 84 and a half, but we remain very much in a range for that. And I really don't see, um, I don't see really much indication that we're going to break out of that range. When you look at the Euro and you look at Sterling, it's really trying to make a choice between two drunks at a bar. Neither are particularly um, um, attractive, but if you have to choose one, you tend to chop and change between one and the other. Um, certainly in terms of the FTSE 100, again here, we found very, very difficult um, to break above 7,600, and we are now slipping back down to um, the mid part of that range, 7,400. We've dipped below that. We could dip back to as low as 7,200, but at the moment, in terms of value, if you're going to be long of any index, then it's really the FTSE 100 you have to be long of because it's very much a value index as opposed to a growth index of which you find the DAX has rolled over, we did break above this trend line here. I've now removed it. We weren't able to consolidate back above 14,800. That's the next key resistance level for the DAX. Um, we could well see a retail, we could see a test down towards this trend line here, which currently comes in around about 13,700, 13,800. So certainly I think the bias at the moment is for a little bit of a return to the lows of the recent range. The S&P, 
we tried to I've drawn some new fib lines in here so bear with me I've taken the highs of January this year taken the lows of last month and we've retraced around about 38.2 percent of that also got the 50-day moving average which looks as if it could well as act as a resistance level as well so I think there's a good chance we could see a revisit of the lows at around about 38 turn so certainly I think this is probably a bear market rally um, I think we're probably going to see further declines in US markets in the short to medium term just to sort of I think wipe out um, some of the optimism that is still around just about there I think when it comes to um, stock market direction I think when you've been buying the dip for 10 years solid it's a hard habit to break um, so we haven't actually as yet reached peak pessimism that doesn't and I think until we do I think there's a good chance we could see a retest of the lows on the Nasdaq and the S&P and potentially uh, a move even lower before we find a short-term base certainly the direction of travel still appears to suggest that there's more downside in the short term when it comes to equity markets and I think much will depend on the messaging that we get this coming week from the Federal Reserve on Wednesday the Bank of England on Thursday the Swiss National Bank on Thursday and the Bank of Japan on Friday so it's a big week for central bank decisions and I think a large part of the market direction could be determined from the messaging that we get from those central banks we've also got chinese retail sales for may on the 15th of june um, and i think it's fair to say the last two to three months have been difficult ones for the chinese consumer covid restrictions lockdown measures um, as chinese authorities fight a losing battle to implement their zero covid strategy and it is a zero it is a losing battle you will never be able to completely eliminate the Omicron variant or the variants of Omicron that are currently affecting the Chinese population. Um, the Chinese growth target for this year still remains at five and a half percent. That is that. Well, I mean, I mean that was optimistic a month ago. Um, it's looking even less likely now. In March, retail sales in China declined by three and a half percent. Um, and in April we saw another steep decline of minus 11.1 percent and that was bigger than the minus 6.6 percent decline that was expected. Industrial production also slowed sharply falling 2.9 percent in April as well. Now we could expect to see an improvement in May um, simply because when the, the, while, the, while the Chinese economy ground to a halt in April there was some relaxation of restrictions in May and that should be reflected in the overall numbers. Nonetheless, we're still expecting to see a decline in retail sales for May of around about 7% and as I outlined earlier, I think it's highly unlikely we'll get a V-shaped rebound when it comes to the Chinese economy on the basis that if you have stop-start measures when it comes to um, easing restrictions, then you'll get a stop-start economy. Now we have seen a softening in Chinese inflation um, in May that came in below expectations and so did PPI but that's not really altogether surprising because you've got demand destruction people can't go out and buy stuff if they're stuck indoors so I think part of that weakness in inflation is likely to be as a consequence of the fact that um, people haven't been able to go out they haven't been able to go out and spend money um, and they haven't been able to go out buy good services eat out or do anything that they would really want to do um, over the course of the past few weeks so I think when we look at the Chinese economy Q2 is likely to be um, you know and even in a very very weak quarter and I would be very surprised if we don't see an economic contraction in Q2. Away from um, China we've also got wages data for the UK for April um, and I think that for me is going to be a big deal because I think for, for several months now um, people have been concerned about how strong or otherwise wages growth in the UK has been and certainly I think if you look at um, the March wage numbers average weekly earnings um, for March ro rose by 7% that was including bonuses excluding bonuses 
was 4.2%. Now in April, an awful lot of those rate, not rate rises, all, all, a lot of those salary increases that were basically um, rolled out by various retailers started. So they will appear in the April numbers. So even though we got a very high inflation number, CPI number in April for the UK, we could also see a significant uplift in wages as well as the 6%, 7%, 8%, 9% pay rises that were rolled out by various retailers get included in those numbers. Now, at the moment, there aren't any sort of, there isn't a consensus for what that number might be. As a, just as a reminder, um, in March, weekly earnings excluding bonuses were 4.2%. I will be very surprised if we don't see a number in the region of five for that particular number um, when the April numbers are released on the Tuesday, the 14th of June. Unemployment is still very low at 3.7%. And I think that's another reason why um, central banks will feel emboldened to be much more hawkish when it comes to raising interest rates. And I think that sort of brings me on to this week's Fed meeting and the Bank of England meeting, which I'm really going to focus on more than anything else. So we're going to get 50 basis points this week to one and a half percent, and we're going to get 50 basis points in July. And there's a good chance we could get 50 basis points in September as well, if the data warrant it, war warrants it. Also, the bond buying or the, the balance sheet reduction program has also started this month with $47.5 billion. So the Fed is now actively reducing the start of its the, the size of its balance sheet starting this month, and that will rise to $95 billion a month by September. Now, I think the, big, the bigger question here is not so much about um, what the Fed do or don't do when it comes to this week. We know they're going to do 50 basis points. It's what they do with their inflation forecasts and their growth forecasts. Um, so that will be the, the key component for me. So as a reminder, in March, the FOMC upgraded their inflation forecast for 2022 to 4.3% from 2.6%. So it's currently 43 and in 2023, they upgraded it to 2.7% from 2.3, while downgrading GDP to 2.8 in 2022. So 2.8 is the GDP forecast for this year from the March projections, and 4.3% is the inflation projection from March. Does inflation get adjusted up? Probably will. Big question is by how much and how much will they downgrade their GDP? forecast and I think a lot of that could determine how the markets react to this week's Fed policy statement. We've also got US retail sales for May which are also due on the 15th the same day as well and on that score the US consumer has actually been doing pretty pretty okay. We've seen retail sales growth in every single month this year. I think the May numbers could be the weakest number this year given the fact that we are seeing consumer confidence still at very, very low levels. And the US consumer has also gone on a borrowing binge over the course of the past three months um, to the tune of around about $40 billion a month. So that I think that's a concern going forward. So it'll be interesting to see how that is reflected in the May retail sales numbers um, as well, on top of the Chinese retail sales numbers. So, so that's the Fed. Now we have the Bank of England as well. Now, the Bank of England, um, yeah, I mean, my, my, my views on the Bank of England are no secret. I think they've been absolutely rubbish when it comes to forward guidance. Um, the fact that uh, Andrew Bailey um, actually came out and said that there's little the central bank can do about supply chain problems, while true, it's not something the central bank should be openly admitting, you know, throwing their arms up in the, and say, uh, uh, in the air and saying, you know, there's nothing we can do, we're helpless. You know, try and show an element of competence when it comes to setting monetary policy. Now, the expectation is we could well see a 25 basis point rate hike this week at the very least. Unfortunately for um, the Bank of England, it tends to lack the cojones, if you like, to do more than 25 basis points, even though we did have three members vote for a 50 basis point rate hike at 
the last meeting. The central bank needs to do something about the inflationary impulse that's been caused by the weakness in the pound over the course of the past year or so. If you look at where the pound is now, it's at 124, but look at where it was, um, you know, look at look at where it was this time last year. You know, it was at 140. So that in itself has exacerbated the inflationary impulse into the UK economy, given the fact that commodities are all priced in dollars and we import an awful lot um, from uh, from abroad. So there has been an inflationary impulse caused by the fact that an awful lot of our um, we import an awful lot of stuff. So that needs to be they, they, they need to give an indication that they're prepared to really get ahead of the inflation narrative and try and tamp down on it. Um, now, whether that will support the pound or not is another matter, but certainly I think they need to try and at least keep track of the Fed. Or, you know, or at least hang on to the Fed's coattails. And, you know, and the argument is, well, well, that will impact growth. You know, that will impact the economy. We're already at stagflation and so on and so forth. You know, what do you think inflation is doing to the economy, if not strangling the life out of it? You know, so you de they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. But what they don't want is the pound to fall below 120 and head towards 115, 110. That is the last thing we want to see. So giving the air of a certain amount of competence would be a start. Um, and certainly I think 25 basis points at the very least, but they need to be, I think, much less dovish and focus on their core mandate, which is basically inflation at 2%. That is their core mandate. That is what they're employed to do. So um, what you know, whatever, whatever that means for the pound, I think the Bank of England will do what it normally does and do pretty much the very least. And uh, uh, and then the bigger question will be, how many more rate hikes can we expect to see uh, by the end of the year? But certainly I think that they need to hike um, the base rate. The base rate needs to at least double from where it is now. So we need to see something in the region of a base rate of around 2% um, by the end of the year. Of course, that won't happen, but you never know. Anyway, I'm digressing ever so slightly. So that's Bank of England um, rate meeting. We've also got the Swiss National Bank. We've got the Bank of Japan, which brings me neatly on to dollar yen, because we're back almost within touching distance of 135 dollar yen. And the Bank of Japan has got a big problem because the decline in the yen has brought it back to levels last seen in 2002 when it hit 135. And only this morning, we've had a statement from the Ministry of Finance, as well as the Bank of Japan, that they are concerned about the decline in the value of the yen. Well, I mean, it's not really a surprise if you come out and basically say that um, your monetary policy bias is for lower rates, not higher rates. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what sort of pivot, if there is any, by the Bank of Japan. Certainly inflation in Japan is... Um, still very low. It's at two and a half percent in April, or rose to two and a half percent in April. It was at 0.5 percent in January. The decline in the yen of 13 percent is likely to exacerbate a significant inflationary impulse into the Japanese economy. At the moment, it doesn't appear to be reflected in the headline CPI numbers, even though PPI is around about nine and a half, ten percent. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of narrative the Bank of Japan comes out. Um, with in the coming few days, whether or not they decide to go down the intervention route, or whether they just they just um, uh, settle for jaw boning the yen higher and um, the dollar lower. I think much will depend on what happens to equity markets when it comes to that. In terms of the overall numbers, looking at Brent crude here. These are obviously the highs that we saw in March. We're below 126 and a half. I think that's going to be a significant resistance level, but at the moment, the direction of travel for crude oil doesn't look particularly promising if we're looking for lower um, fuel prices. And on the earnings front, it's been a significantly challenging week for retailers this week, declining consumer confidence, some of the retail sales numbers that we've seen. Uh, over the course of the past week or so, have shown weak consumption patterns 
um, consumers are issuing um, more expensive household items, furniture and what have you for, for cheaper items. Um, we've, we've heard profit warnings from Target this week in the US, um, too much higher margin inventory, which they can't get rid of. And they're looking to focus on um, some of the lower margin stuff. And it's not surprising that people are prioritizing food over pretty much anything else. So you know, that's why we, when we see Tesco's numbers, um, which are due, which are due on the 17th, their first quarter numbers, will be interesting to see what consumption trends Tesco's come out with. Certainly, I think in terms of the share price movement that we've seen over the course of the past few few months, there I think there is con significant concern about margins um, as the costs um, for doing business go up, fuel costs, logistic costs, delivery costs, um, given the current costs of petrol, that's going to be a significant, it's going to have a significant impact to an awful lot of retailers. Tesco's has already pledged to increase wages, staff wages in its efforts to retain its service levels. It's raised salaries by 6%. Rising fuel prices are likely to increase the cost of maintaining delivery and logistics. Cost saving measures will go some way to mitigating that, but they're not going to mitigate all of it. So that's a big challenge for Tesco's. JD Sports, there is an expectation at some point JD Sports will issue its full year numbers. At the moment, there's not a drop dead day for that. It could be some time this week. They've been in the news for all the wrong reasons. They were fined £5 million by the CMA um, for breaching an order that barred it from further integrating foot asylum into its business. Um, last week, it also um, got fined another £2 million quid for um, anti-competitive behaviour when it came to the sale of Glasgow Rangers, Glasgow Rangers merchandising. So, And the departure of its chairman, Peter Cowgill, was also seen significant amount of weakness in the share price recently. Not back to the lows that we saw in 2020, but certainly I think there's a concern about margins, not only in its UK operations, but also in its US operations. And we've also got Boohoo, um, fast fashion. Fast fashion is falling out of favour. Well, obviously, the, the headlines with, with respect to misguided, um, the fact that fast fashion isn't particularly environmentally friendly has been has hurt the share prices of companies like Boohoo and ASOS obviously misguided went bust I don't think there's any chance that Boohoo will do that but certainly I think in the context of where we could go to next um, the big the big level on Boohoo share price is the lows that we saw earlier this year on the 8th of March it seems to be very much a case of a dead cat bounce when it comes to Boohoo's margins um, for this year, Boohoo is saying that it hopes to consolidate its market share gains and expects to see revenue growth in the low single digits and adjusted EBITDA margins between 4 and 7% as it looks to raise its prices to combat the erosion in its margins. Certainly, I think the collapse of some of its closest competitors will help in that. Whether, of course, or not, it will be enough remains to be seen. So, I think that's pretty much it for this week, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend and I'll speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you for listening.